Last week, we, are, we talked about an interesting topic, and um, it was interesting because we talked about that topic on Tuesday. Every Tuesday night, we have what we call conversations, and uh, we talk about what happened the Sunday before, themes and, and uh, issues and whatnot, and then we kind of let it go from there. I thought the uh, topic last week would have kicked up a lot more dust than it did. Either that or people just weren't willing to really, you know, give me a hard time. But the topic was, you know, why does the world have to be the way it is? Couldn't it be some other way? And is the world just the way it's supposed to be with all of its defects, with all of its injustice, hatred, bias, wars, everything, the pandemic, all the things that are going on in our world today? Does the world really have to be that way? Or is it just the way it is? And if it's just the way it is, then we're not supposed to fix it. And so how do we deal with a world if it really were engineered for a purpose in this very way? What if the world was engineered in just a way to affect our purpose, to give us the means to affect our purpose? And I use the, uh, the line from James 1, starting right at verse 2. I know Brendan will put it up there. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you overcome, when you encounter various trials, knowing that, if I could read, it would be fine, knowing that the Testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. So what James is telling us is that it's endurance through trials. It's endurance through challenges and difficulties and turmoil, through trauma. That is the testing of our faith that produces the perfect result, the wisdom that he talks about in a few verses. So that means that in order for us to get to that perfect result, we've got to have some mountains to climb. And life is certainly engineered, the world is certainly engineered to give us those mountains to climb in order to get to our completion, to get to meaning and purpose, to even get to a sense of identity. So I don't know if you buy that or not. That's okay. You don't need to. But following that thought, even if the world is what it's supposed to be, and there's no need to fix it, but we need to move through it. Or if the world needs fixing, the question then is, then what? What do we do next? If we do believe that the world is what it's supposed to be, is that all we need to do? Just endure? Is that it? Keep breathing? Move through it? Or is there something else that needs to happen? Are we just supposed to accept the injustice that we see around us, the inequality we see around us, the oppression, the suffering. Just endure it? Is that what James is saying? Is that enough? We have to talk about what our purpose is. If we know what our purpose is, have you ever thought about what your purpose is here as a human being breathing on this planet? Well, it certainly seems to be from everything that Jesus has said and everything that we read in the scriptures that our purpose is connection. Our purpose is love. Our purpose is learning how to love. Our purpose is accepting that love requires vulnerability. If we're really going to connect with another person, we have to be open and vulnerable enough. We have to let our heart leave our body, so to speak, in order to really be connected with another person, which is the scariest thing that we can do because we are completely defenseless at that moment. But if our purpose is connection, if our purpose is love, then love requires more than simply enduring. Love requires more than just accepting the world as it is. Now, we may not be able to change the world, but what love requires is that we never stop trying to show up for change. We keep showing up to the work of change. That's the endurance that I think James is talking about. Regardless of the outcome, regardless of what can happen out there in the macro, if we just keep showing up for change, if we keep showing up with the willing heart to alleviate any suffering that we encounter right in front of us, then we are showing up to, I think, what James is talking about that will take us to completion. If our purpose really is love, if our purpose really is connection, then the means that we use must match the ends that we seek. The means that we use must, must match the change that we are seeking to affect. 
in the world. There has to be that one-to-one -one correspondence. We aren't going to get to love through fear. We aren't going to get to connection through disconnection. Like breeds like. And if love is really guiding us, if love is really at the heart of our work for change, then what is that going to look like? How do we know if we're really doing it? You know, one of the big issues that's, that's on everybody's lips right now is the debate between peaceful protests and violent protests. That's on all the news. We've seen it play out over the last few months, and we're all talking about it. Which is really needed at this point in our history, at this point in the mix of things, to affect the change that needs to be affected for those who are oppressed, for those who are marginalized? Now, both sides of the argument, they have a point. You know, the people who are going for violent protests are saying that nonviolence takes too long. Too many people are suffering in the meantime. It's a slower process. We need to speed it up. There is a, uh, a quote that goes that the riot, a riot, is the language of the unheard, attributed to Martin Luther King saying, when people are unheard for too long, when they are simply ignored for too long, when the oppression goes on too long, there is no resort but to violence. But then on the other hand, those who are advocating nonviolence are saying, if our end game, if our goal, if where we are trying to get is unity and connection, then the only way that we can get there is by practicing unity and connection, to nonviolently Get the attention of those in power to nonviolently put the question so emphatically in the minds and in the hearts of the people that it can't be ignored any longer. What does love really require us to do? How do we move forward? How do we make a choice between these two poles, these two ways of looking at affecting change that needs to happen in our society and in our country? I think we need to go to Jesus first. Take a look at James. I'm sorry, take a look at Matthew. Chapter 5, right at verse 38. This is Jesus redefining the law, and he says, you've heard it was said by the ancients. You've heard that it was said in our tradition, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So he's talking about reciprocity. You know, you do this, you get the same thing, and, you know, evil for evil. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, it kind of sounds a little codependent. Kind of sounds a little bit like a doormat. Kind of sounds a bit passive. But Jesus was anything but passive in his life. And he couldn't have meant passivity here. Think about Jesus and the way that he taught and the way that he lived his ministry. If anything, it was a muscular spirituality, wasn't it? It was full of energetic action. It wasn't passive. And it certainly wasn't meaningless, middle of the road, milk toast. Jesus took strong stands. He had deep convictions. There was a continual confrontation between him and the religious authorities, constantly. He was never afraid to speak truth to power. Look at all the Sabbath controversies that you read throughout the Gospels. This is Jesus actually picking a fight. <laughs> He's not letting it lie. He is not being passive. He is taking the fight to those who need the fight taken to them. But the fight is nonviolent. He's simply showing them the absurdity of some of the rules that they had put in place about Sabbath, about every aspect of the people's lives that was now a roadblock between them, a brick wall between them and the experience of their God. He cleansed the temple, for goodness sake. That was anything but passive. He engaged in his own manner of civil disobedience. We saw this over and over again. Yet, at the same time, he never returns evil for evil. And that's what he means by turning the other cheek. That's what he means by this whole section here. 
He speaks truth fearlessly. He protects the oppressed wherever they need to be protected, fearlessly, but never in retribution, never in anger, never in revenge, and never just in a tit-for-tat way returning what was dealt to him. He still loves those that he rebukes, and we see that in him. He may rebuke at one moment, and when the person comes to him in sincerity the next, he's right there for them as well. He always returns love no matter what is dealt out to him. Take a look at Matthew 5, right, just following, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was the tradition of the rabbis. That was the tradition. You won't find it in the Bible anywhere. It's not there. It was part of their oral tradition. It's what the rabbis actually taught to the people. Hold that enmity in your heart until the other one actually makes amends and does what they're supposed to do. Then you can forgive them, but not before. But Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good equally. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers... What more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that scares the heck out of us. How are we supposed to be perfect? All he's talking about is being completed in love. When we get to the point that we can extend the same consideration to those who are distasteful to us, those who are not connected to us, and those who are actively oppressing us, giving us a hard time, insulting us, just generally annoying us. We are perfected in that moment in love, and that's what he's talking about. He loves and treats everyone as he treats himself and those who are closest to him. There is no difference in how anyone is treated in Jesus' life, in his teaching, in everything that he models for us. Take a look at what he does in the garden at Matthew 26, verse 51. This is right after the Last Supper, just before he's arrested, as he's being arrested. And behold, one of those who was with Jesus reached out and drew his sword. This is Peter, as the other Gospels reveal for us. And he struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? Jesus rebukes the violence. The violence is natural. It's a defense mechanism. We want to do it. Jesus is being betrayed and arrested unfairly. He did nothing wrong. His followers know that. The arresting officers probably know that. It doesn't matter. It's a corrupt system. He rebukes the violence, though. And Luke tells us he heals the ear that was cut off. And he voluntarily, voluntarily submits to authority. Voluntarily submits. Rather than fight, even though he had the power to fight and win if he had wanted to. He voluntarily submits to the authority because he knows that the fighting is not his purpose. He later tells Pilate, this, my kingdom is not of this world. Everything that you look at and everything and every way that you measure power and ascendancy has nothing to do with the economy that I am working in and within and through. He's trying to get across this in everything that he does. And then finally, in Luke 23, at the, time, at the crucifixion itself, verse 33, when they came to the place called the Skull, Golgotha, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. This is the ultimate expression of nonviolence. You want to know the real meaning of the cross? This is it. Everything that had been done to Jesus, the gross injustice that was being done to him, the 
absolutely hideous method of execution that was being done to him. And yet, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Understanding that they are so blinded by their hatred or just so blinded by the system in which they have been living all their lives, they're no longer sensitive to the things of the Spirit. They no longer understand that connection is their purpose. Jesus is reminding in this stark way that even then, regardless of circumstances, here is the expression of nonviolence, non-retribution, returning love for evil at every turn. This is what Jesus does. But as you read all of that, and you think about our situation here in our, in our current events, this form of nonviolence that Jesus is teaching and Jesus is modeling doesn't seem to be aimed at systemic change. It's not aimed at the system out there, the machine, right? And he shies away from the role of the community organizer. Whenever that mantle is tried to put on him, he, he backs it off, he shrugs it off. He's not an activist, he's not a rebel here. He's still trying to work on people's hearts. And yet, how do we take this teaching of his and bring it back to the situation at hand? How do we know how to move forward if we're just using Jesus' teaching? You know, he's kind of the opposite of public relations, isn't he? I mean, even when he healed people, he often instructed them, don't tell anybody. Don't tell them what's going on. He wasn't about trying to make the big splash. He wasn't trying to, to gather crowds and gather power and arrogate to himself the things that revolutionaries need or just social activists need, what social changers need. How will this nonviolence apply in our current situation today? Probably the one in American history who applied Jesus' teachings most strongly and to the greatest effect as a principle for systemic change in the United States was Martin Luther King. Think about that. But King himself admitted as he was studying and trying to figure out how he was going about, as a Christian pastor, this work of, of, of civil rights and, and ending the racial injustice in the United States, he had trouble as a Christian pastor seeing how the New Testament teachings and Jesus' teachings would apply to the racial situation that he was facing until he studied Gandhi. When he studied Mohandas Gandhi and what Gandhi had done 20 years before in India, 20 to 30 years before, then it started to make sense to him. And Gandhi wrote that he was indebted to Henry David Thoreau, as well as his own tradition, in developing the nonviolence and the application to that in his fight for Indian independence and his fight for, for racial equality in South Africa, where he really started. Three figures here, Henry David Thoreau, Mohandas Gandhi, and Martin Luther King, from three different traditions. Thoreau, Thoreau was a transcendentalist. Gandhi was a Hindu. King was a Christian, but they all three arriving at the same conclusion, all deeply involved in trying to change the unjust situation that they found in their countries at their time, all coming to the conclusion that nonviolence and nonviolent non-cooperation, I think that's the key phrase, nonviolent non-cooperation, to them was actually love in action. Love in action that would become an unstoppable force as it was being applied. Thoreau is an interesting character. I don't know if you've ever studied him. You probably know him from the book Walden, you know, when he spent two years on Walden Pond. And he was an ecologist, he was a philosopher. This is 19th century. He died right in the middle of the Civil War in 1862. He was a poet, he was a writer, essayist, activist, uh, abolitionist. He was ardently, stridently against slavery in the United States. He was also an ecologist, trying to go for whatever ecology was in, in the 1800s. He was a forerunner of modern ecology because he was so about the preservation of, of, uh, of the natural environment. 
but he was a radical thinker. This guy, talk about not being passive, this guy was radical. He basically re wrote, and this is the, uh, the essay that caught Gandhi and King's attention on civil disobedience, and I don't know if you've ever read that, but it's, a, it's an essay that he wrote about the situation in the United States at the time, and especially under his saddle, the burr under his saddle, was slavery, of course, but also the Mexican-American War, which was going on in the 19, 1840s. And he wrote that no government is just. No government is just. Every government is corrupt. Every government promulgates injustice. And therefore, <laughs> no individual has an obligation to obey such government. Kind of the exact opposite of Romans 13 that we studied a few weeks ago, isn't it? No government is just, and so therefore, no individual under that government has an obligation to obey. And in fact, they have an obligation to disobey. Absolutely disobey. Now, if everybody did that, of course, that would be a recipe for anarchy, obviously. And no government could exist, and he understood that. He also understood that most people weren't going to be doing this anyway, so it wasn't really in danger of creating anarchy. But he was trying to make a strong point here, and he made that point. For him, slavery was absolutely intolerable. And he worked and worked to try to support those who were abolitionists and to affect the change in that area anyway. The Mexican-American War was a war that was basically fought so that the United States could gain what is now the southwestern United States and Texas. All of that territory north of the Rio Grande and what is now north of our border was won in that war. Most of us probably don't know that the US Army went as far as Mexico City and captured their capital city before the Mexicans were willing to cede all that territory to the United States. Thoreau looked at that war as a absolute, you know, bald-faced example of American imperialism, and he thought it was absolutely wrong. And he decided, well, all he could basically do is not pay his taxes. If his taxes were supporting that war, he wasn't going to pay his taxes. And of course, he got arrested and thrown in jail. And his friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, came to see him and said, Henry, what are you doing in there? He said, Ralph, what are you doing out there? This was the idea that he had. He understood that not everybody is going to live their lives out in politics. And there was no obligation for any individual to right the wrongs that they find in their civilization. But they had the obligation not to participate in those wrongs must not be associated with any of those wrongs. We can pursue other goals, and most people will, other than politics. But he said you must do it without standing on another man's shoulders, which he meant by that is you don't support and you don't benefit from an unjust government's policies. And he felt that voting for justice was not enough because that was passive. There had to be some action that you can take in order to be what he called the necessary friction that slows and eventually stops an unjust government. And this was nonviolent disobedience. This was nonviolent non-cooperation. But as you engage that, you had to be willing to pay the price. Whatever that government was going to levy on you, you had to realize that you had to pay that price, to be in prison, to be fined, whatever would happen. And for that reason, he said, and he did, you needed to live simply, have as few possessions as possible, because you'd have that much less to lose. <laughs> and he was never married. He never had children. He never had family. He lived as simply as possible. He lived this out. This was his life. Obviously, it's not going to be everyone's life. But look at those principles. Look how strongly they are articulated. Look at the passion with which they're articulated. And look at the conclusion he reaches that the action that we can take most effectively is nonviolent, non-cooperation. Now, Gandhi's story is very different. He was born in India. He was married at 13 years old in an arranged marriage. He went to school, and eventually he went to London to study. Now, India at the time was part of the British Empire. Gandhi grew up as a British subject. He really considered himself, up to the time that he got out of college and went to South Africa to practice law, he considered himself a Briton first and an Indian second. He spoke English fluently, 
He spent three years studying law in London at a college there, and he passed the bar there. He became a, a, a lawyer. He went back home to India and was having trouble putting a practice together when a friend called him and said that a firm in South Africa that he was connected with needed a lawyer badly. And they wanted someone who was a local in their province. And so he went to South Africa, packed up the family. This, by this time, he had a couple of kids, and they moved to South Africa. He figured he'd be there for a year. So here he walks in at 23 years of age into South Africa, into the whirlwind that was the racial situation in South Africa. He was immediately branded a person of color. He had dark skin, of course. The segregation was rampant. He was thrown off a train. He was thrown off a stagecoach. He couldn't sit with the passengers in the stagecoach. He had to sit on the floor in the front with the driver of the stagecoach. He walked too close to a, a somebody's house, and they threw him into the street. It was on and on and on what he was suffering. When he was thrown off the train, he spent the night shivering in the train station, wondering what he should do. Maybe just go back to India, or should he stay and try to do something about it? Well, you know the story. He stayed and decided to try to do something about it. He ended up staying in South Afri Africa for 21 years. And by the time he left South Africa, he was an internationally known social activist, lawyer, writer, and, and, and someone who was fighting for the people's rights. It was amazing what happened in that time there. And he learned and understood, both by reading Thoreau and returning to his Indian roots. You know, he was wearing Western clothes this whole time. He looked like anybody else from the West. It wasn't until he went back to India in 1921 that he finally took the loincloth and took the, the garb of the poor people to identify with him. But as he realized that the British wouldn't accept him as an Indian, he went back to his Indian roots. And in his Indian religion as a Hindu was a concept of ahimsa. Ahimsa means exactly what we're talking about here. Ahimsa is literally the absence of injury, but it also means nonviolence. It's a foundational principle in Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism. He went back to that foundation. He read Thoreau. He was able to put the nuts and bolts together and create great change in South Africa through nonviolent, non-cooperation. And when he moved back to India, he applied that same principle of nonviolent, non-cooperation to Indian struggle for independence from Britain as well. He was immediately elected into their Congress that, that the Indians were, were forming in preparation for their move for independence. And he started working as he had, had many successes and in 1930, he decided to take on the British salt tax and salt monopoly. And this is kind of weird, because not even some of his contemporaries thought that he's, you know, he's going to deal with a salt? What the heck? But the British had created a monopoly on salt. Now, for us here, with refrigeration and everything, we don't understand the importance of salt in not only the ancient world, but we're only talking, you know, what, 150 years ago? Without refrigeration, salt is an absolutely essential ingredient of life. It's the only thing that can preserve food. If you don't have antibiotics, it's the only thing that can preserve you when you're wounded. It is an absolutely essential ingredient. Everybody needed it. The British monopolized it. You could only buy salt from the Brits. And they put such a heavy tax on it that the poor couldn't even afford the salt. Those who are living on the seashore, you know, you can just get a bunch of seawater and boil it and you're left with salt. You can make your own salt. That was illegal. You couldn't make your own salt. If you did, they would arrest you. You had to buy it from the only British stations that sold it at this exorbitant price where you couldn't afford it. So Gandhi takes this on because it was so immoral, and it hurt the poor pe poorest people the most. And so what he did is he organized a salt march, and he started in his own home, in his uh, ashram, and walked 240 miles to the sea. It was the western coast of, of India. And he had 80 marchers that started with him. And they all wore the white, the traditional garbs of, of, the, uh, of the Indians. They walked 10 miles a day, so it took them 24 days, average of 10 miles a day. They stopped at every village along the way, and they spent the night. They had news uh, photographers 
following them. And they had the newsreels back in those days, and so they were filming as well as taking stills. He was giving interviews at every stop. He was writing articles. It was a PR genius move on his part. In 1930, when this occurred, Time Magazine made Gandhi their man of the year. The Brits didn't even know what hit them. They were so unprepared for this. They dismissed this whole thing as a lark. By the time those 80 marchers got to the sea, there were 50,000 people. They called it the White Flowing River because everyone wore white, and it was just gaining strength every day, more and more people going with them until finally they get to the, the sea. And what does Gandhi do when he gets to the ocean? He picks up a handful of, of salty mud and sand and boils it in a pot and it makes illegal salt. And then he calls on the entire nation to make illegal salt to break the back of the English salt monopoly. And then the following week or two, the, the, the next step in this stage was then to do a quote-unquote raid on, on the salt works that were right nearby. And so he organized this but got arrested, and his followers carried it through. He actually called the British authorities and told them that they were going to do this because it wasn't about actually raiding and stealing salt from the salt works. It was about nonviolent, non-cooperation, and a confrontation with power. They knew what was going to happen when they got there. 2,500 marchers arrived at the salt works, and 400 police were waiting for them with steel-tipped lathes, which are clubs. And they went up 25 at a time in rows, and they were clubbed down. The American reporter who was there wrote about it. And I want to read you that account so you can just understand, or try to understand what this was like. Gandhi had informed the British authorities about the intended raid on the salt works. The marchers were told, you must not use, the marchers were told, you must not use any violence under any circumstances. You will be beaten, but you must not resist. You must not even raise a hand to ward off the blows. American journalist Webb Miller was an eyewitness to the beating of marchers with steel tipped lathes, and his report attracted international attention. He writes, not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like ten pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening wax of the clubs on unprotected skulls. The waiting crowd of watchers groaned and sucked in their breaths in sympathetic pain at every blow. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious, or writhing in pain with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. In two or three minutes, the ground was quilted with bodies. Great patches of blood widened on their white clothes. The survivors, without breaking ranks, silently and doggedly marched on until struck down. When every one of the first column was knocked down, stretcher bearers rushed up, unmolested by the police, and carried off the injured to a thatched hut, which had been arranged as a temporary hospital. Group after group walked forward, sat down, and submitted to being beaten into insensibility without raising an arm to fend off the blows. There were not enough stretcher bearers to carry off the wounded. I saw 18 injured being carried off simultaneously, while 42 still lay bleeding on the ground, awaiting stretcher bearers. The blankets used as stretchers were sodden with blood. At times, the spectacle of unresisting men being methodically bashed sickened me so much I had to turn away. I felt an indefinable sense of helpless rage and loathing, almost as much against the men who were submitting unresistingly to being beaten as against the police wielding the clubs. Think about that for a second. This American reporter was having such a hard time getting his head around, comprehending what he was seeing, that he felt as much disgust for those who would not defend themselves or protect themselves as he did for the ones that were clubbing. It's just, it's hard to unbelieve. It's unbelievable action on both sides. But the British didn't, they weren't prepared for this. They didn't know how to handle it. It took them by surprise. They didn't know what hit them or how to deal with it. And so they didn't know how to respond. This obviously turned world opinion against the British and was the beginning of the end for British rule in India. Now, 30 years later in Alabama, 
Not much has changed. In September 1962, Martin Luther King convened a meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, the main organizational force behind his civil rights activism in Birmingham, Alabama. King was, given a talk, was giving a talk on the need for nonviolent action in the face of violent white racism when a white man jumped on the stage and without a word, punched him in the face repeatedly. King naturally put up his hands to deflect the blows, but after a few punches, he let his hands fall to his side. The man, who turned out to be an American Nazi party member, continued to flail. The integrated audience at first thought the whole thing was staged, a mock demonstration of King's nonviolent philosophy and action. But as King reeled and real blood spurted from his face, they began to realize it was no act. Finally, several SCLC members rushed the stage to stop the attack, but they stopped short when King shouted, Don't touch him! Don't touch him! We have to pray for him. The SCLC men pulled the Nazi off King, who was beaten so badly that he couldn't continue the speech. Precisely because the attack wasn't staged, it left an immense impression on the convention attendees and anyone else who heard about it in the coming days. King hadn't been just preaching nonviolence. Confronted without warning by a racist violence, he lived it, even at great risk to himself. King did not invent nonviolence as a doctrine for achieving social justice, but he adapted it for an American context and showed how compelling yet flexible that it could be. King had absorbed Gandhi as a practical application of Jesus' teaching and was using it in the American South. And he lived it as deeply as Gandhi lived it, as deeply as Thoreau lived it, willing to pay the price for nonviolent non-cooperation. You know, we tend to think of Gandhi as a spiritual leader, but he was deeply political. In fact, really, he was more of a political leader than a spiritual leader, but the two connected, right? And we tend to think of Martin Luther King as a political leader, but he was deeply spiritual. To miss the way that their spirituality motivated and guided their political action is to miss the point entirely of their lives, of their approach, and also for our purposes this morning. I want to read just a little bit about Gandhi from, Martin, from Thomas Merton's point of view. Thomas Merton was the American um, Trappist monk and writer, and he wrote a book, Gandhi and Nonviolence, and this is important for us to try to understand. Merton writes, In Gandhi's mind, nonviolence was not simply a political tactic which was supremely useful and efficacious in liberating his people from foreign rule. On the contrary, the spirit of nonviolence sprang from an inner realization of spiritual unity in himself. The whole Gandhian concept of nonviolent action and satyagraha incomprehensible, is incomprehensible if it is thought to be a means of achieving unity rather than as the fruit of inner unity already achieved. So that, that Sanskrit word that he just used, satyagraha, was what Gandhi coined to, to describe what he was trying to do. You know, it literally means holding on to truth, but he was using it kind of as a truth force, right? Nonviolence as the truth, as the way toward the goals that they needed in, as, as a people. But Merton's point here is so well taken. The whole Gandhian concept of nonviolent action and satyagrapha is incomprehensible if it's thought to be a means of achieving unity rather than as the fruit of inner unity already achieved. Indeed, this is the explanation for Gandhi's apparent failure, which became evident to him at the end of his own life. He saw that his followers had not reached the inner unity that he had realized in himself and that their satyagraha was to a great extent a pretense, since they believed it to be a means to achieve unity and freedom, while he saw it that it must necessarily be the fruit of inner freedom. The first thing of all, and the most important of all, was the inner unity. 
the overcoming and healing of inner division, the spiritual and personal freedom of which national autonomy and liberty would only be consequences. However, when Satyagraha was seen only as a useful technique for attaining a pragmatic end, political independence, it remained almost meaningless. As soon as the short-term end was achieved, Satyagraha was discarded. No inner peace was achieved, no inner unity, only the same divisions, the conflicts, and the scandals that were ripping the rest of the world to pieces. And this is what happened as soon as the, the British granted independence to India in 1947, immediately split the country into Muslim and Hindu nations, and the racial violence was rampant. And Gandhi was devastated by this. His people had not made the internal transformation that allowed them to move to the real goal that was being sought. Gandhi said in his own words, nonviolence is not a garment to be put on and off at will. Its seat is in the heart, and it must be an inseparable part of our very being. If love or nonviolence be not the law of our being, the whole of my argument falls apart. Here he's trying to go with this. Thoreau, Gandhi, and King lived their nonviolence, lived their humility as a part of their very being. It was their transforming principle. It was who they were, not a tactic. It was involved in the larger struggles and issues. But the way forward always came from the inside out for them. Now, Martin Luther King had a similar trajectory to Gandhi's life. It was not until King began to study the life and works of Mohandas Gandhi that he began to see the possibility of applying nonviolence to the specific problems of African Americans, especially in the South. As he later told it in Philadelphia, he listened to a sermon about the teaching and actions of Gandhi, and in particular, his use of nonviolent mass protest to challenge British control over India. King left the sermon transfixed. Though Gandhi was a Hindu, King saw immediately the similarity with the teachings of Jesus and the possibility of applying Gandhian nonviolence in an American and Christian context. King had struggled to see how the lessons of the New Testament could be useful in the struggle for racial justice. Prior to reading Gandhi, I had about concluded that the ethics of Jesus were only effective in individual relationship, he wrote. But after reading Gandhi, I saw how utterly mistaken I was. For King, the heart of Gandhi's nonviolence was love. In the spiritual, transcendent form of the word, in the face of coercive, racist British rule, Gandhi so loved his oppressors that he refused to take up arms against them. But Gandhi was not without his critics. Some of her observers said he was lucky that the British were the ones doing the oppressing and questioned whether the Nazis or racist American whites would have allowed similar flouting of the law, however nonviolent. King was willing to take a chance that, at least in America, the answer was yes. King argued that nonviolence was anything but passive. Nonviolence resistance is not a method of cowardice, he said. It does resist. It is not a method of stagnant passivity and deadening complacency. The nonviolent resistor is just as opposed to the evil that he is standing against as the violent resistor, but he resists without violence. King wrote, nonviolence is absolute commitment to the way of love. Love is not emotional bash. It is not empty sentimentalism. It is the outpouring of one's whole being into the being of another. I don't know how much better you can say that. What did King mean by nonviolence? It was not merely the refusal to hit back and insistence on turning the other cheek. It was in its own way aggressive. It meant putting oneself in the face of violence, of actually confronting it and responding with love to the jabs and the punches just as the salt marchers did at the salt works. Just as King did as he organized march after march to confront power. King, toward the end of his life, like Gandhi, toward the end of his, realized that his followers and others in the civil rights movement were not where he was in his inner transformation to unity. 
As the 60s wore on, more and more groups opted for violent means as their patience ran thin with a slower progress of nonviolence. But King never wavered and was still organizing nonviolently when, like Gandhi before him, he was killed by an assassin's bullet. I wanted to finish this morning in a way that I normally don't. Normally, I, I just like to extemporize and talk. But last night, as this, as this was coming out, it came out just in writing. So I'm just going to read how I'd like to leave you this morning. Responding with love. Always responding with love, regardless of the circumstances. If we can do this, nonviolence is going to be like water following the law of gravity. It flows, yields, fills any space or container exactly and fully, leaving nothing untouched by its presence. And in sufficient quantity, it is the most powerful force on earth. Nothing can withstand it. Given enough time, not even the highest mountains. Nonviolent non-cooperation, following the law of love, flows, yields, fills any space, and in sufficient quantity and given time, it is the most powerful force on earth as well. Enough people simply refusing to cooperate with unjust authority can't be ignored or stopped any more than a tsunami. But if the change created by nonviolent non-cooperation is going to be real and lasting, then the love has to be real and lasting as well. The inner transformation has to be real and already achieved in the hearts of those seeking change. Because if not, then the change achieved will dissolve back into the same divisions and conflicts, just with different details. Gandhi said, if one does not practice nonviolence in his personal relationship with others, his personal relationship with others, he is vastly mistaken. Nonviolence, like charity, begins at home. He's saying that true satyagraha, nonviolence practiced from the inside out, and not just as a technique, a means to a particular end, is the result of a transforming spiritual experience that will have effects in every relationship in our lives, especially the most intimate ones. It couldn't be any other way. If our love and transformation is real, we will be nonviolent in our homes, in our churches, in our schools, as well as in the streets. With one person or 10,000, whether media cameras are rolling or not, if our transformation is not real, if inner unity is not real, we may fool the whole world, but not those closest to us. And now we're back to Jesus. He said, love your enemies and those who persecute you. How do we do that? Do we need to be marching in the streets, being beaten by police, or going to jail for our non-cooperation? There may be a time for that. But as Thoreau recognized, that is not everyone's path. Not even the majority of everyone's path. Most of us will pursue life in non-political ways. But every one of us is obligated not to cooperate with the injustice we see around us in whatever way our lives present that injustice. Starting with our own families, are we submitting to the welfare of each person we are trying to love? Are we communicating nonviolently, sharing space nonviolently, resisting the attempts at manipulation and domination nonviolently? In our workplaces, social groups, sports teams where competition can be fierce, are we working and playing nonviolently with the welfare of everyone as our first priority? With anyone who serves us in stores, in shops, restaurants, homes, businesses, are we nonviolently dealing with each and every person, honoring every person over whom we have authority? If we can't start here in our most intimate and daily encounters, it's because nonviolence isn't at home in our hearts, and larger issues will always remain out of reach. In truth, nonviolent non cooperation is really the delicate balancing of our submission to the humanity 
of those who are oppressing us while resisting the authority of those same people when their authority is unjust. Submission is a hard word for us, but here it simply means that we're continuing to follow the law of love, to act on the best interest of the person in our path, whether or not that love is being returned. Submission like this is not passive or weak because balanced with resistance, it recognizes that the greatest love we can give is to help another person out of the oppression of their own hatred and prejudice, to show them how harmful their violence toward others is for themselves, to resist hatred and prejudice while never violating the law of love ourselves, to submit to the desire for another person's welfare even if it delays our own is the highest form of love and is the only force strong enough to make change permanent. But ultimately, the only lasting change we can make in this world is to ourselves. We have no control over the rest, but that's also as it should be, since our purpose here is to find our way to connection and love in its deepest sense. But though changing the world or the person across the table is completely beyond our reach, continuing to show up every day to the work of change without falling into obsession on one extreme or complacency on the other is the only way to that purpose. Jesus and those who have chosen to follow him, even from their own traditions, show us what that way looks like. Our own way will have infinitely different details. But if we're really following Jesus, it will always have the same shape. Let's pray. Father, help us to see things more clearly. Help us to discern between alternatives that may be hard to choose between. And when our patient grows thin, help us to continue to fall back, lean back, and be guided by your voice and not any of the thousands of others that may be screaming at the same time. We want to follow your voice. We want always to be practicing who you are so that whatever ends we achieve are always in line with who you are. Help us to be willing to have that kind of patience, to continue to show up tirelessly even when we've been beaten down and to never grow weary of the well-doing that you've shown us. It's a difficult world, Lord. You know how much. Help us to continue to navigate it with integrity and with you at our side. We're so grateful that you are always with us, Father. Never let us forget we can't do any of this but that you've done it first. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Would you all stand?